Love this podcast? Support this show through the Acast supporter feature. It's up to you how much you give, and there's no regular commitment. Just click the link in the show description to support now. Brothers and sisters, we have a potential serious issue on our hands here. Okay, we are talking pro wrestling media abusing drugs. That's what's being speculated by not only fans who pay attention to pro wrestling media, but even the wrestlers themselves. On this special edition of the Duke Les Wrestling Podcast, we have former law enforcement officer Brad Shepard, who is going to use his expertise to shed some light on some of the things that we've seen, not only in pro wrestling media, but in general. Is this potentially drug abuse gone wild, and that's why people are talking and acting so erratic? Oh boy, let's get on with the show. You're locked in. Look at what we have here, folks. To the only show that matters. The cream of the crop. Duke loves wrestling. And there is no one that does it better than your host. I have come here to chew bubble gum and kick ass. The Duke. And I'm all out of bubble gum. Welcome back to the Duke Loves Wrestling Podcast, the show about pro wrestling and everything else. And brothers and sisters, he is back. One of the most controversial figures in all of pro wrestling media. One of my favorite guests. And overall, just a a guy that you never know what you're going to get, but you know it's going to be a good time. The one, the only, Brad Shepard. What's going on there, Shepard? Duke, I'm I'm honored to join you on the Duke Loves Wrestling podcast again. We always have a good time. Uh, Let's do it. You know, man, I I get asked about you on a routine basis. People, hey, how's Brad? Where's Brad? What's Brad up to? And it's just amazing how many people are curious about what's going on with you. They want to hear your thoughts. Um, And certainly there's a lot to talk about. So let's start from the top here because something very, very interesting happened. And and I actually, I sent you a a, a screenshot of this because I was shocked. Couldn't believe it. Psycho Sid Vicious. He put out a tweet where he said, and I quote, I finally saw the video of trash writer Sap snorting coke while on camera. That kid was wasted. He's definitely a scumbag. Now, I want to make something abundantly clear, brothers and sisters listening right now. I'm not 100% sure what video uh, Psycho Sid is referring to. I have seen a video in which it certainly looks like Sean Ross Sapp uh, put his head down, and I heard what I think is some sniffling going on. And people have speculated that maybe Sean had inhaled something. I don't know what that something was, but maybe he had inhaled something. And then when he uh, appeared back on camera with his face and he's rubbing his nose and all kinds of other interesting things. I don't know if this is the video that Sid is talking about or if there is another video which clearly shows exactly what's going on. Nonetheless, Brad, your former law enforcement... You have unfortunately encountered all different types of of criminal activity, unusual activity, including folks who have been under the influence of various substances. What's your general take on Sid's tweet? Let's start there. I mean, what do you think about Sid's tweet? You know, I, I think people who have experience in using drugs or people who have experience in detecting the use of drugs or someone may be impaired, you know, they're going to have more of a, I guess, a professional or a, an experienced perspective when they speak on that issue. And so for that reason, it is interesting. Now, personally, myself, uh, being a former law enforcement officer, just to give the context, as you mentioned, I was trained in detecting people that were under the influence of not just alcohol, but drugs as well. And they have what we would call a horizontal gaze nystagmus uh, in their eyes. And there's other certain behaviors 
Uh, so when you're dealing with someone who is impaired under the influence of drugs, they do have specific behaviors. Some of those behaviors can also cross over as well into people who maybe aren't under the influence of a substance, but they're mentally ill. Um, sometimes those those behaviors do mimic each other, but certainly I did see a video and uh, this was brought to my attention. I, I don't follow Sean Sapp's uh, work whatsoever. I'm not in the loop on anything regarding Sean Sapp, but I did get the video that I believe is being referenced here that I'm assuming. Um, and certainly I do have my own thoughts about that. And again, you know, I was not in the room with Sean Sapp. I wasn't hanging out with Sean Sapp. Um, I haven't drug tested Sean Sapp. I don't know Sean Sapp personally. So I'm not stating this as a matter of fact. I'm stating this as a person who has professional experience and has observed something. Nothing more, nothing less. So so the video itself, what do you think? I mean, did, first of all, they, they're, in my opinion, it sounds like and it looks like there was some type of inhaling going on, okay? There's definitely some kind of sniffing, taken in, going on. Yeah. Um, I believe Sapp has put out a statement stating that he was blowing his nose, which means he was blowing out. Are, are you familiar with, with the ability to blow your nose by by uh, inhaling? Is that is that a thing that you're familiar with uh, there, Shepard? Yeah, I can't say that I am. I, I do have issues... With my nose as well, perhaps a deviated septum. I, I have seasonal allergies. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm sympathetic to that. Certainly never heard of that. And he did appear to be certainly um, taking in a substance, it seemed. Taking in something. Nasal spray, whatever it is, we don't know. But there definitely appeared to be something going on there. Uh, and... And that's not something in my experience uh, that I've seen typically with a nasal issue like a deviated septum. Again, maybe I'm wrong. It could be. But just in my experience, having those issues as well. Uh, as far as observing things, there were some mimicked behaviors of what I've seen in people who are impaired by a substance. Um, and sometimes people who are also mentally ill. So, again, I'm not saying that is the case with Sean Sapp. I'm not saying that's the case here. But I am saying the video that I saw, presuming that it's unedited, that that behavior in that moment is also something I've seen mimicked with people who are under the influence of drugs. You know, the, the twitch-like movement. Um, and also talking of his, his jaw was going back and forth and he seemed to be kind of all over the place with his eye contact. Like you mentioned, obviously it appeared to be inhaling through his nose and it just didn't seem like a normal human reaction to what we would consider an allergy or a nasal issue. Again, just my opinion, and it is based on having actual professional training and experience. It's interesting because we we see these pro wrestling media personalities. These are people who cover wrestling, whether they're they're writing, podcasting, uh, what have you. We see them and those who are sympathetic to them. The behaviors go beyond just. I like this type of wrestling. You like a different type. So we're going to debate. We're going to argue. I disagree. I love this match. I, I didn't like that match. It it has devolved into literally people cussing you, um, challenging people to fights, jumping in inboxes, challenging wrestlers to fights. Yeah. Very, very um, unusual behavior. I wonder, again, as a, as a professional, as someone who literally had to be trained in how to identify these sort of things, 
Brad, I'm deferring to you in this regard. Um, is that consistent behavior with people who may be under the influence, the fact that they're they're looking to to get into physical altercations over over very trivial things. I like a, a wrestling thing or I I like a particular person. I'm going to have them on my show. Now I got to get cussed out and threatened, doxxed, all kinds of other uh, behaviors here. W- would you say that's consistent with somebody who may potentially be abusing uh, substances? Yeah, uh, I, I believe so. I mean, again, having that experience and being on the receiving end of something like that and, and knowing firsthand that, that that's happened uh, with some folks. Yeah, I, you know, I've seen that with people, that sort of erratic behavior who are under the influence at the time or also have a mental illness. And again, this is not a, you know, it's not a negative thing. We want these people to get help, to get treatment, uh, to be well. Um, but we have to be able to talk about these things as well, instead of normalizing them, that it's, it's okay. There's nothing wrong. What you're seeing isn't really what you're seeing. Everything's just totally normal and that's okay. And you have to pretend it is. Well, that's exactly it. And, and, you know, kudos to you. And and I definitely piggybacked on this. We, we made it a point not to poke fun at addiction and potential issues uh, associated with that. We, we were pretty straightforward and, and serious about the fact that if, in fact, drugs are being consumed and abused, um, especially as a person is, is performing their function as a wrestling media personality, that is now we've gone into the realm of are you promoting this stuff to your followers? Are you trying to normalize addiction or or abuse and in that sense i mean it's not okay it's not okay and i'm calling it out and i've seen far too many times these folks the way that they carry on they they have very low lows and they post about it it's mental health this and i want to i want to unlive that and all these weird ways that they describe these things um and then they cheer on folks who be, behave in a manner that certainly looks like they're under the influence. It, it gets escalated when they're at these live events and they're taking videos of themselves clearly intoxicated, promoting the fact that they're intoxicated. Have you seen these videos, Brad? I have. I've seen them. And, you know, my first thought when I saw them was, wow, this person really should be embarrassed, not acting like this is cool, right? You know, you're a professional, you're at a professional event, and that is your first impression for many people, or that is how you present yourself to, you know, the the companies, the people that you cover for a living. And, And to do that and be just sloppy and unserious and, you know, I just, I, I was embarrassed for them, really, was my sentiment. And uh, I'm not surprised by any of it. Of course, obviously, as you know, you know, uh, but, you know, these behaviors revealing themselves, it's a good thing in a way, obviously, because these are the people that they are the gatekeepers, the problem problem children in in the IWC and the wrestling media. Uh, And so this sort of thing being exposed is a good thing. Having that accountability is a good thing because the truth is, you know, these folks haven't had any accountability, whereas someone like me is under a microscope nonstop. Someone like you, Duke, is under a microscope nonstop. And, And it's time that we spread that love a little bit. Absolutely. I mean, at the end of the day, there are a lot of children uh, who, you know, just by nature of their parents listening to the show in the car or something like that, they they hear my program. Or they may see if I'm doing a live uh, shot with somebody, they may see that as well. And I'm just going to tell you right now, drug abuse is not acceptable. If you or someone that you know is, is uh, having an addiction issues, they need to get help. And certainly I encourage you to, to make a call for them, or if you are the person, make the call, get help. Okay, there, 
regardless of where you live, there are drug treatment facilities, there are websites, your local government. You can get help, and it's okay. And just because the world feels like it's a big weight on your shoulders and you have these mental breakdowns online in front of a bunch of strangers every couple of months, it's okay. You can get help for that. You don't have to turn to abusing drugs. So I'm just going to put that out there. Whoever the shoe fits, make sure you prance around with it because it's yours. But it's not acceptable. And it's a disgrace to the entire wrestling media concept because here's what's happening. The wrestlers and the promotions, they're getting fed up. They're getting fed up with these media personalities acting like tough guys, thinking that they can go around threatening to, to fight this one and challenging to fight that one, cussing this one. You, ha- you had, a, you had a, a media personality the other day literally out one of his sources One of the biggest names in wrestling and CM Punk was outed by one of these humanoids recently as a source. Just completely unprofessional and unhinged to do something like that. And a disgrace, quite frankly, to do something like that. I mean, did did you see that when Punk was was outed? I saw that. I could not believe it. And when I saw that, I wasn't surprised by who did it. Sean Sapp. And this, in my opinion, is because of Sean Sapp's ego, because of Sean Sapp's desire to be an authority and important in wrestling. His his ego wouldn't allow him to not do that. Uh, And that was a giant mistake. And if you're in the pro wrestling business, if you're a pro wrestler right now, and you look at that and what he did, and you give him information, you are a fool. Because he has now proven for the entire wrestling world that he will not protect his sources. Period. And, he, and he's proven that if his source decides they don't want to talk to him anymore, that he'll throw a, a complete public tantrum <laughs> yeah. and start revealing things that he had no business revealing. Right? It's amazing. Yeah. It's yeah. Amazing. I, I could not imagine doing something like that with all of the big stories I've broken. I couldn't imagine just saying, yeah, so-and-so told me this. <laughs> yeah, I'll probably never talk to him again. Yeah, I, I, it's just, it's complete lunacy, you know, as you talk about sourcing and managing that relationship and the confidentiality, you know, the nature of that in particular in wrestling, where you know that outing a source can lead to them being fired. It can lead to them facing consequences on the job, even if they're not fired. You know this. So why would you ever do something like that? Yeah, even if CM Punk doesn't talk to you again, there may be other wrestlers that say, hey, I don't want the CM Punk treatment. I can't talk to Sean Sapp about anything. It's just amazing. And let me tell you something, folks. There are people in the business who will publicly denounce certain uh, wrestling media folks, but then be in their inbox feeding them information. Mm. They're trying to protect their anonymity in that regard. So don't think for one second everyone that's taking shots at people that means that they're completely against them. It's it's often, you know, the opposite. There's certainly people who have taken shots at you, Shepard. There's people who have taken shots at me. Yeah. And then, you know, they're they're definitely asking us to help them get information out at the same time. You do the math on that. You know what I mean? But that's the whole point of when you have a source, you protect that source. You don't say who they are. You certainly don't have a tantrum when the source decides they don't want to feed you information anymore. I mean, there's a, there's an entitlement factor to this where it's clear certain people in, in wrestling media feel like they should be the ones that get all the information. And if they're not getting the information, then it's time to act like a scorn lover and, and burn your house down. Right. It's, it's insane. It, it really is. Uh, and, and the truth is Sean Sapp should be getting a lot of backlash from this. Uh, you know, he's not going to. We've talked about this system, this structure in pro wrestling, 
with these gatekeepers, you know, the Meltzers and the Saps, et cetera, so on and so forth. And so there won't be any real significant backlash, but there should be. People shouldn't accept this. Pro wrestlers shouldn't accept that. And the subscribers to Fightful Select shouldn't accept that kind of journalism. But, you know, wrestling, it's it's a low bar. There's low standards. And behavior like this just gets a pass from these guys over and over and over. It's true. It's true. You know, we said his name, so we might as well jump into that a little bit here. CM Punk. He was uh, fired from AEW. Tony Khan is on record stating that CM Punk threatened the lives or put the lives uh, of many people, including Tony Khan himself, in jeopardy, which is really strongly worded um, stuff there. I, I want to get your take on this, Shepard. I mean, what could CM Punk have possibly done that would make the president of the company literally say, "I my life was in jeopardy because of this person? Well, he certainly had to be threatening or aggressively moving towards Tony. You know, I think one of the, the big takeaways from this is it was a big issue because this involved Tony and not just one of the other wrestlers. Like, you know, you guys doing this is not okay, but, you know, Tony had that laissez-faire attitude, like some will get along, some won't. That's the wrestling business, blah, blah, blah. He gave essentially a statement like that before. And then this incident came not long after that, and it involved him. And now all of a sudden, we've got to take some real action, right? So... You know, that was kind of, to me, the double standard in it all. It was all just the boys being boys and okay, part of the business until it happened to him. Uh, that being said, I do think he felt threatened. I do think CM Punk was, I think he lost it, you know, and that's my opinion. And I think CM Punk is a guy who he targets people he believes he can. In other words, he doesn't mind attacking Jungle Boy. What the fuck is Jungle Boy going to do to him? Nothing. And again, CM Punk, Phil Brooks is a failed MMA fighter. 0-2. Never won a fight. But he can, you know, bully around one of these smaller wrestlers. And he knows he can do that. And that's what he does. Do you think he's going to go to, I don't know, Brock Lesnar, to a Mark Henry, to a big show and try to pull that same shit? Absolutely not. So he targets who he can. And I believe he also felt in that moment he could target Tony Khan. And that is when it became a problem. That's when he had to go. And again, I have to put a lot of this blame on Tony Khan because he allowed all of this to happen. Again, it was all okay when it wasn't him. He allowed it to fester and get worse. He did nothing as a leader. And then it became a bigger problem than he could control. But CM Punk, you know, this is a guy who is a locker room cancer who doesn't play well with others. Um, how could you look at his career and think it'll end anything other than badly? going into AEW? That's a great question. And, and I do wonder about that as well, because it's not like we weren't warned <laughs> that this guy doesn't play well with others. Um, but something different is happening, and you're absolutely right about that. It, it, it feels like Punk found himself in an environment where no longer was he one of the weakest people in the room. He, he felt like he could be the most intimidating guy in the room. And I don't know what that says about the AEW locker room. Um, are there a lack of, of people who can properly defend themselves against people who want to act like tough guys? I don't know what's going on there. That, but that definitely should be investigated. Well, I mean, have you seen the roster, Duke? I mean, we're talking about uh, a roster of guys who in large look like the fans could beat them up that are watching the shows. So hell yeah, that's what I think is happening here. When when CM Punk can just walk up to people 
and challenge them to step outside. When he can walk up to to executives and 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 other employees like like a Chris Daniels and kick him out of the building. No, you're not working here tonight. Get the hell out of here. What? You want to step outside? You going to do something about it? You going to step outside? The fact that he can do that and Tony Khan didn't fire his ass for that. That lets me know that I I mean, has CM Punk been eating the spinach? I know he's supposed to be straight edge now. Is is he eating his spinach? Do, do we need to t- take a look at his spinach or his Pepsi and find out? There's some kind of, I don't know, macho juice going on there. Where the hell did this guy come from? Where now he's the big bad badass in the locker room. Yeah, I, I know. Um, you know, maybe we should suggest drugs for him. You know, maybe maybe this guy does need to take a few hits of a joint. Uh, so that he can calm down. I, you know, I don't know. His behavior has been erratic. Um, he's supposed to be straight edge. Uh, does that include prescription medication? Because, you know, maybe he needs something to regulate his behavior if he's in the workplace and having these sort of physical incidents. Uh, uh, that's not normal. How many people go into a job and, you know, they have a disagreement and they have a, a physical altercation? So you wonder about those comments that that Kevin Nash made and about CM Punk's behavior. And, you know, something there is behavior wise, not normal compared to the average person. Yeah. Kevin Nash had alluded to the fact that Punk is starting to go down the road of ultimate warrior with his behavior and burning bridges and just the impression that he's leaving on everyone as a result of his behavior. And we know that the ultimate warrior was. absolutely taking steroids he admitted it himself on the records no one come for me that's a fact and a lot of his uh actions as a result were were road rage worried rage i should say so when nash says something like that it it gets me to thinking you know punk is coming off of a, a major injury he was gone for almost a whole year is it possible that he was prescribed so this is legal but he was prescribed some type of steroid or or what would naturally be be uh, classified as a performance enhancing drug and is it possible that this is um exasperating punk's attitude where before he would just run off at the mouth and pout and and you know that was the end of it but now he wants to act like he's the uh, incredible hulk and he wants to choke out people for having the audacity to, to actually have a conversation with management and get approved to do something in their match and then go out and do it and celebrate it. Punk needs to choke them out and beat them up over it. And if the president of the company tells him to stop, then he needs to threaten his life too. I mean, what the hell is going on with this guy? <laughs> well, you know, and I have to point to the AEW drug policy. What is that exactly? Yeah, what is it? Yeah, good point. Good point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so there is... No real accountability there. Now we do know, exam- you know, for example, in WWE's drug policy, you can get a medical legal prescription for something and it'd be okay. But this is largely a little bit of the wild, wild west when it comes to AEW. And so we don't know is honestly the truth. That's not being regulated in any way. Uh, but we do know there is certainly a behavior pattern. There certainly is. And and here we go again. I've been asking for a couple of years now, is AEW a safe work environment? And Tony Khan himself has gone on record and, and he stated that no, it was not. But he's blaming CM Punk for it being an unsafe work environment and he, and he fired. Do you believe, Shepard, that now that CM Punk is, is gone, that suddenly AEW is is a, a safe work environment? Do you believe that their, their lack of safety uh, has been cured suddenly because you got rid of this one person. You've got the bullying of Thunder Rosa. You've got CM Punk in a, a backstage altercation. You've got a bunch of other incidents as well. You've got alcoholics and they're serving alcohol backstage. This is not the best work environment for a serious professional uh, for someone who may be recovering or for someone who doesn't want to get caught in the crossfire of something like this. 
you know, where you've got the executive vice presidents in a fight with the top guy, you know, et cetera. And, you know, for me, this isn't the kind of workplace that I would want to be in. And I think that's what people have to remember is there's ultimately this sort of romanticization of the old days where, hey, they were real men and they went out and, you know, they'd fight and make up after, et cetera. And I, I get all of that. But would you yourself want to go to work every day in that work environment? And the answer for me, if I'm being honest, is no, absolutely not. And I don't think the average fan would either, even those who would say, hey, you know, it's all part of the business, blah, blah, blah. Well, well it shouldn't be. Because you right? know it, you know it's going to end. I mean, if the president of the company is the one playing bartender, and 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 playing Mr. Party favors, how long can that last? You know, yeah. at what point is are you going to wake up one day and no longer have a job because the damn president of the company has crashed, and now Daddy has to to send him somewhere where he has to get his stuff together, or worse, right? That's not yeah. a stable environment. That's a place where I'm constantly going to be wondering, am I going to have a job tomorrow? <laughs> Because because this guy wants to be friends with everybody and he and he and he's literally making the drinks uh, in order to accomplish that. That's a scary situation. That's a scary situation. And Tony Khan, I know you're listening. I know you hate listening to everything that I do because you're 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 dreaming of the day where you can finally catch me and 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 do something about it. I beg of you, Tony. You can bring everything that you got including my good friend over there, Mega. I am not afraid of you. I would love to to go through the process of discovery and expose all of the nonsense that goes on in that company. I know a lot about what's gone on. You would be very mortified if you knew what I knew, my friend. I know about some of the things you've done here in Boston as well. I know about a lot of the things happening in Jacksonville and how the local elected officials and the people around there, how they view you, Tony. You do not want to dance. So, and I'm saying this on the record over and over again, because I know what you've been trying to do. Good luck to you, pal. I would love for you to even make a move anyway. And that's not Brad Shepard talking. That's, that's the Duke. And I'll just leave it at that. Moving on here. There was a, um, a story about a guy from Forbes magazine who tweeted This isn't even an article. He tweeted that he would value AEW at $2 billion. That's his valuation (laughs) of a company that literally cannot even sell out a 10,000-seat arena right now. He would value them at $2 billion. They can't even get a new TV deal yet, right? Their contract is up at the end of this year. The network hasn't even picked up the year option yet, Yeah, but he's going to value them, a company that's still not profitable. Tony Khan just went on the record again and stated that he needs his next TV deal in order for AEW to be profitable day to day, which is interesting language there. And th- and they're looking for a 3x increase on their TV deal. So it's not like whatever they're getting paid now is going to get it done. They're spending way more than they're, than they're uh, earning there, right? Yeah. Two billion dollars, yeah. Shepard. Which what's your take on is is AEW worth two billion dollars? Yeah, AEW's not worth a billion dollars, much less two billion. You know, much less anything close to a billion. I mean, this is a company that is not even profitable. They're operating in the red, and the tell was Tony's remark about the TV rights, right, and what he's seeking and what they need to be profitable day to day. You know, forget the other stuff we know. That alone was a tell. So it's a, a difficult position for him, but, and, and he's a private company, so he doesn't have to reveal pertinent information like a WWE would. So we know he can be, we know he can be a carny promoter and he can lie about it, or he doesn't have to give the whole truth. He can give a half truth. It doesn't matter. Let's be honest. Many of the fans in AEW are going to believe whatever he says anyway. But a billion dollars, two billion dollars, not even close. Again, you look at the base of their operations, which is the United States, and they're not selling out arenas. They're not even close. 
they're not even selling on half the arenas. I, I mean, you know, the typical shows right now are half empty at minimum, minimum. And he refuses to go to smaller venues because of his ego. But to act like all the payroll, all the expenses he has with everything to produce TV and the talent and the, the road, et cetera, this is a business operating in the red. And you think that someone is actually going to buy it for $2 billion? Like, are you on drugs? That's more than many sports teams in professional sports. And you would have us believe that AEW which is attended by 5,000 people, you know, which is watched by less than a million people, is worth more than that. I mean, it's it's so insane on so many levels. Like, and you point to that article, and the guy who said it is not someone who's in the financial industry. And then Dave Meltzer takes it, and, you know, Dave Meltzer, like, circles back using his own opinion as like a credit to the story in another article, like there's this whole circle of like fake news where, you know, they're trying to pretend like it's credible, but you read it. It's all like Meltzer and this one guy at Forbes, you know, who is not in the financial industry. So it's a, it's a scam thing to build up value for AEW. And it's just totally ridiculous. Yeah, Dave Meltzer doesn't know jack shit about finances, about the business end of professional wrestling. That area is way out of his depth in many regards and certainly not something he should stick to. But, you know, unfortunately, like everything, Dave says something and people will believe it. Tony says something, people will believe it. And, um, you know, that's that's where we're at. But, yeah, two billion, not even close to being there. Not even close. Now, you just said something that's interesting. This guy who made that quote unquote valuation, is he not in the financial industry? No, no. My understanding, he's not in the financial industry. That is, and, and listen, the valuation was literally pulled out of thin air. Um, it's not yeah. like he was able to see AEW's books, so he has no idea what Correct. they're what they're spending money on. He does. He has no idea uh, how much money they're taking in. So if 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 <laughs> if you don't even know that much profit versus loss, there, how the hell can you make a valuation of a company? Exactly. And you've got Dave Meltzer on Twitter pointing to an article that sources him. So it's like, <laughs> it's like Dave Meltzer said it. And then the article says the valuation, they point back to Dave Meltzer. And then Dave Meltzer points back to the guy at Forbes. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it's just, you know, it's all a, like a, a circle of fake news when you look at the details. It's fascinating. I mean, look, I, do we want AEW or, or another wrestling company who can rise to the the heights of legitimately being an alternative to WWE absolutely that would be great for the industry great for us as as fans and people who cover pro wrestling and great for the wrestlers most importantly there and their families that would be wonderful certainly great for municipalities where these wrestling events run which is definitely something that I am always focused on how much how much tax revenue are these events generating in different uh, cities and towns and what have you, you know, what is the effect of having wrestling events like that? Um, so certainly I would love for it to be real, but it's not real in this case. And it's embarrassing. And it's obvious that they're doing this because they're trying to help AEW land their next TV deal. And it's like, look, if the reality of what your business is can't land you your next TV deal, then maybe you shouldn't be on TV. I mean, come on, Shepard. Yeah. Am I going too far by saying something like that? No, I mean, the problem with AEW is they're trying to grow too fast and they're doing it without the success in their business operation. You know, Tony's used his influence and power and money to, to get additional shows. But at the end of the day, he should have been focused on making Dynamite work before creating all these other TV shows. You know, because these other TV shows, they're going to do what? Three, four hundred thousand viewers. You've got Dynamite typically now in the eight hundreds. What was that original number for Dynamite? Remember the debut episode? They've dropped over half their audience. And, you know, where did those people go? You know, they're they're at the point where it's not about even going after the folks who could be new fans. They're trying to keep the fans they have. 
because they have lost plenty of those, much less the casual viewer. And so instead of addressing that, they're just creating more shows and more content and hiring more wrestlers to do fake matches. I mean, it's just, it's an awful, awful business strategy that they will never be able to sustain long term, you know, and, and until they get these things fixed. And, you know, uh, Tony to me seems to be a guy who doesn't listen to advice. You know, it's certainly not the people who would give him honest advice. And so that's, that's a bad thing. You know, <laughs> you know, I think all successful leaders, they listen to others. They listen to the experts. They listen to other people. Even if they aren't an expert, they listen. It doesn't mean they have to take their advice and, and implement something. But listening and getting other ideas because you know you don't know it all. You're not the expert in everything. That, that makes a good leader. And I don't think he really does that. So, you know, they're just focused on the wrong things. Again, they should be focused on making dynamite work and then create a second show. And you can go back and look at WCW and when they had Nitro and they brought in Thunder and how that worked out. Again, there's a blueprint of failure for that already in place. And he seems to have ignored that because he thinks he can do it better. And the bottom line results are telling us that's not true. Not true at all. And, and ironically, switching speeds here, the WWE and their Endeavor deal, uh, by the end of this week coming up, it should be complete. Right, we're only a couple of days away, mm-hmm. according to Endeavor, that WWE sale will f- will be finalized, and the the merger of WWE and UFC being under one umbrella, TKO Sports or whatever they're going to call themselves there, Vincent Kennedy McMahon being the chairman of the board for both the UFC and WWE, uh, Nick Khan, president of WWE, will report to Nick to uh, Vince. And Dana White, president of UFC, will report to Vince. But Vince literally would be the person uh, overseeing all of that. What are your initial thoughts here? Because at this point, the the WWE, they sold for $9 billion. Um, Even though there's been a slight dip in the stock recently, still, they're close to an $11 billion valuation. And that's real. (laughs) That's actually the real (laughs) stuff, right? (laughs) Now, now, they started this year as a three billion dollar company. The fact that they're that they're over ten billion dollars in value at this point, I mean, what's your what's your take on that? Just from a general standpoint, uh, Shepard. Financially, they're extremely strong right now, and that's a credit in large to Vince McMahon, the guy that everyone in the IWC wants to vilify. He took a company and grew it to levels that his father, Vince McMahon Senior, never would have thought he could do. I mean, this is an incredible American dream story. And having Vince McMahon in a high level role in this new company, well, that only makes sense. Look at what the guy has done with WWE. And there's no telling what he could do with a UFC. He knows business. And I think this is all a credit to his success. And I think... As a new company, they're going to take WWE and UFC both to the next level. I agree, and and, and we're kind of seeing the the next level uh, developing here because you know with Fox canceling their WWE themed uh, podcast web show, whatever the hell it was there that uh, Ryan Satin <laughs> was in charge of, and and you know shout out to Ryan Satin. It, it's unfortunate that uh, looks like they they fired him from that show, uh, canceled the show, whatever it was. Um, you know, good luck to you, man. You know, hopefully you land on your feet. If all else fails, you can go back to TMZ and, and, and do that thing again. But it's clear that the, the relationship with Fox and WWE is, is no longer mutually beneficial because WWE, they're, you know, they're going to make money and Fox needs to save money. Mm. And the two just aren't, they're not going to meet here. I'm hearing um, Disney and I'm hearing Amazon as two potential networks that SmackDown could be on. Now, you know, Disney has access to actual TV, whether it be ESPN or ESPN2, whatever. Uh, Amazon is strictly streaming at, at the at the moment here. 
But what are your thoughts on that from a general stand? First of all, the, the fact that they're pulling the plug on WWE specific programming, uh, the show that Satin was covering. What's your what's your thought on that there, Shepard? Uh, well, I think it's perfectly fine for Ryan Satin not to uh, host a, a show called Out of Character. He never had any. So I'm, I'm pretty pleased about that fucking particular thing. Because this is a guy who, again, for people who don't know, that went out of his way to use his platform behind Fox Sports, a massive platform, to damage my reputation within the pro wrestling space. He's a very dishonest person. He is someone who's fallen upwards his entire quote unquote career. So I, I don't have any sympathy for him. I don't like him. You know, I don't root for people to lose their jobs, but this this is someone who, you know, felt like he's just kind of going through the motions. And uh and I'm glad he'll have a new opportunity, hopefully outside of wrestling. Well, and that's Happy the thing, and I, and I don't mean to cut you off, Shepard, but he's he's contemplating, and he's tweeted about this, leaving the wrestling space entirely. I mean, come on. Don't you have some sympathy for that? The guy loves wrestling, and now he may have to say goodbye to it. Uh, au revoir. But, you know, I mean, look, you know, he's already, you know, this is what a, a sleazy carny this guy is. He's already taking shots at WWE and social media. Yeah, you know, people love something in WWE, but with the indies do it, you know, they hate it. So that was that was clearly like right after his his show was canceled, right? It was just very recently. And so, you know, he's he's got the grift going. He's gonna be anti WWE now that, you know, he needs the grift of potentially going elsewhere in wrestling. So he's leaving that opportunity open. You know, and, and that's what these carnies, these grifters do. Me, I always tell it like it is. Sometimes it's pro WWE. Sometimes it's anti WWE. Sometimes it's pro AEW. Sometimes it's anti AEW, vice versa, etc. That's just the way it is. I'm just speaking the truth and being honest and in speaking facts and not worrying about saying something for where my next opportunity may be, like all these other carny ass sleaze bag liars in the wrestling media. So. Hey, I wish him good luck. Again, I don't personally hate the guy necessarily. Don't like him, but I don't know him on a personal level. Um, so hope he finds something that makes him happy. But uh, I, I can't say that we'll ever be on each other's Christmas card list. Well, again, I you know Ryan, good luck to you, man. I, I think that you've you've proven that you can start a lot of um, interesting, buzzworthy things. And, you know, hopefully in your next iteration, you, you avoid getting into any kind of physical altercations with other media personalities, because that definitely could be embarrassing. Um, and, you know, stay off of the social media where you're trying to give other personalities a hard time as well, because why would you do that? You know, just play it straight. I said everybody, just play it straight. You know what I mean? And, and, and I listen, I feel bad for, for Satin because I know that. Um, his significant other, she, she takes care of her mom and I know that's a big mm -hmm. thing and that's part of the, her, her brand actually. And, you know, it's a big deal when you are the main contributor or you are half of the main contributor in the household. And then suddenly somebody pulls the plug on you. What am I going to do next? <laughs> mm. You know yeah. what I mean? But on the same token, I wish people like that would consider that when they go after others. Right. And that's my problem. And I was yes. completely pissed off when Satin took that shot at you utilizing Fox to do it. Yeah, it was frustrating because the story was true above all. Like that's why it was, you know, frustrating. And, and years later, I've had to hear that from trolls online that, you know, Fox Sports, Fox, their big platform, you know, says that I'm fake news and don't listen to me. And I mean, I had to go to an executive at Fox to, to clear this up over his behavior. So, yeah, I, you know, I don't think that you do business like that. Uh, you know, I wish people who had a problem with me would just come to me 
and and try to talk about it uh, rather than these childish games. Look, man, I you know when when I saw controversy and everyone was talking about this Brad Shepard guy, I reached directly out to you because I wanted to know, hey, what's going on here? People are saying X, Y, and Z about you. I want to know what the truth is, and and that is how you and I built our relationship, Shepard. Yeah, legitimately, what you just said. I went to you. I didn't play games, join the mob and talk trash and carry on in that regard. No, I went directly to you and say, okay, buddy, come on the show and let's let's have a conversation and let's see. Let's see who you really are. And ironically, you've been the same guy from day one. And yeah, absolutely. And the listeners love it. And that's the craziest part about it. It's like, you know, people say whatever they want to say. And that doesn't mean that everything you say I agree with. We we openly disagree about what we openly disagree about. But it's respectful. We don't play games with each other. And, you know, I I trust you more than I trust a lot of these other knuckleheads who will smile in your face and then bury you behind your back, blackball you. There's so many things that these guys do. Yeah. There are people in wrestling media who come back and tell me that the, the games that they play with people in their lives. And that's the thing. This is people's lives that you're playing with. And it's like, you're not tough. You're a friggin' media personality and you're barely that. Just play it straight, folks. Imagine that, you know. So, again, you know, with with Fox seemingly divesting in WWE, it's clear that uh, SmackDown is going to have a new home after 2024. Mm-hmm. Maybe it'll happen sooner than that. We never know. But I don't think WWE is going to have any problems landing somewhere else. Clearly, uh, they're in high demand. Yeah. Yeah, they're in high demand, Duke, to your point. I mean, I think specifically getting back to your question about, you know, the landing spots in Disney and Amazon, you know, I think those are two fits. Disney is, of course, has a financial issue, but there's also potential of Apple perhaps purchasing Disney. Um, That is one report I've recently heard. I think naturally it could be a fit outside of the financials if they can make that work. I think Amazon is a a very good fit. Uh, I think Amazon, you know, they're looking for live sports. I know that to be true. And in this, you know, what this is being packaged as, absolutely. So, you know, and you've got to look, at, and I don't think a lot of people people have explored this, but you know, would you present UFC and WWE together in the same channel or the same streaming outlet? Well, oh, Jesus, they have enough content between the two of them. Right. Yeah. So I think they have a lot of options is the point. Uh, but yeah, I think Amazon is a, is a great fit. You know, a lot of people have it easily accessible. And, um, you know, I, I just, we're in a streaming era now. So this would be a big step in it's something I think they should seriously consider, but I think they will. And I also agree with you that um, the show was canceled because Fox and WWE are done. And that's great. And, I, you know, some of these folks who don't know how to interpret anything, they they look at that and they say, oh, look at that. Fox doesn't want anything to do with SmackDown. <laughs> and it's like, no, you don't realize this. It's not SmackDown. <laughs> right, right. It's definitely Fox. They're right. on the downswing. Uh, and clearly... I just told you WWE is worth over $10 billion now. That is not a, a, a speculation either. That's a fact. They were a $3 billion company at the beginning of this year. That level of growth lets you know that they're not, they're not slowing down at any point, and they're not going to take less of a deal from anyone. Now, Raw is absolutely going to stay with NBC, uh, you know, Comcast, Universal, whatever the hell they call themselves these days, NBC Universal, they're going to stay there. They're, they're, they're going to stick with them. Um, NBC is a longtime investor in WWE. What's happening with Peacock and the, and the network and all that stuff has been so, it's been the only thing that's worked for for Peacock, quite frankly, because the yeah. office has, has largely been a bust. You know, they thought people were going to spend money monthly to watch the office. Yeah. <laughs> it's just it's so ridiculous you know what i mean just yeah. ray charles could have told you that no one is going to look at that it just doesn't make any sense but wwe with their monthly pay-per-views and their major pay-per-views like a wrestlemania 
with their their live events like or or their other programming, original programming like NXT Level Up. I know that that's a small level thing, but it matters. It still brings in some type of viewership. It still keeps people on your network. And then you have the original programming and the documentaries, and then you have the history. And you have all these other promotions from the past that's all part of that package. That has been the most valuable thing that that Peacock has on their network other than the Olympic coverage. Right. So that says a lot. You know what I mean? So I, I don't think that relationship is going anywhere. I think that's going to continue to expand, uh, and rightfully so, which is great. I, I wonder, Shepard, just from a general standpoint, where do you see – Everything's shaking out over the next year because AEW still hasn't gotten their deal yet. And it's clear that WWE is not going to have a problem landing their next deal. Are we going to have this two man situation again? Let's say in 2024, even in 2025, are we going to have two major companies or is this really the beginning of the end? I think it's up in the air. You know, again, you, you talk about, WWE's options and it's going to be a big money deal. You know, if they go to Disney, well, guess what? Here's one thing. Disney owns 80% of ESPN. Well, guess what is on ESPN? UFC. Well, guess who the new company is going to be made up of? WWE and UFC. Point being, they have a lot of options. They're going to get big money. They're going to be there. They're going to be the leader in the industry. AEW aside, the only question is what's going to happen with AEW? Look at their main event picture right now. I mean, seriously, who is in their main event? So CM Punk is gone. Daniel Bryan, whatever, Bryan Daniels, whatever name he's going by, he'll be gone within a year. Those are his words. John Moxley is awful. Sting is eligible for Medicare. And Chris Jericho's really not that far behind. The four pillars are either a bust or they've been badly exposed like MJF. So what do they really have as a selling point? Those extra right fees they're going to want. They can't present CM Punk as their top guy to get that. So it's a, a very precarious position for AEW right now. They don't have the draws. They don't have the main event picture. They've got a bunch of shows that have declined year over year in ratings. I mean, they, it, it's a disaster. CM Punk was the guy that was the face of Collision. He's gone. Now they're going to get three or 400,000 viewers. And you want to give them more money for content that's losing viewers? I don't know. I think that's going to be a tough battle. And... If it weren't, then they would have already had an increase in rights fees by now, in my opinion, right? So I think that that's telling. So it's up in the air for them. And ultimately, Tony Khan can have this company run, whether it's on TV, not TV, until the cows come home and the money runs out from Daddy Shad. But if they're going to be profitable and grow, they're going to need TV. They're going to need mainstream TV. And whether that's streaming or an actual cable, that that doesn't matter. They've got to have that outlet for people to watch. And right now, I think it's a tough sell. So it's up in the air with them. Well, Shepard, you, you definitely have blessed us with uh, your usual insightful, <laughs> sharp, you know, the same Brad Shepard that we always uh, appreciate coming on the show. What's the best way everyone can uh, keep up with you and, and all of your musings, so to speak? The best way to keep up with me is on X, formerly known as Twitter. Follow me there at It's B Shep, B E S H E P. And uh, I'm guaranteed to make you laugh, cry, or offend you. And maybe all three in one tweet, or post, as I should call it now. Before you go, Shepard, a message to your supporters and a message to your haters. To my supporters, thank you. I know it's not easy supporting me because of the social pressure of these losers in the IWC. So just know that, you know, I appreciate you. I appreciate you supporting me. Even if I don't see your post or like it or retweet it, I 
I see it and I support you and I thank you sincerely. Uh, for my haters, keep on hating. I don't block any of you. I do have plenty of you muted so I can continue to get the interaction. So thank you for that. And, you know, the reason you hate me is because you ain't me. How about your favorite admirer, Ben Hameen? Ben Hameen. This guy is so desperate for relevancy and attention. But Ben, the only way you're going to get it is through me. So get your mop bucket, motherfucker. This is Tony Schiavone, and we're desperately out of time on Duke Love Wrestling. Let's talk hydration. See, I carry something to drink with me every single place that I go because I am concerned about being dehydrated. It runs in the family. Everything from dry mouth, dizzy spells, fainting, it's pretty serious. And I've tried all the different types of waters and sports drinks. Let me tell you something right now. Liquid IV. That has been the most efficient at keeping me hydrated and doing so pretty quickly. Okay, Liquid IV has five essential vitamins and is two times faster at keeping you hydrated than water alone. And I'm serious, man. Everything from vitamin C to vitamins B3, B5, B6, B12. Liquid IV also is non-GMO, so it's free from gluten, dairy, soy. So for all you folks out there with food allergies, this may be right up your alley. And I know what you're thinking, but how does it taste, Duke? Well, it tastes pretty good. Okay, we're talking my favorite in pina colada. We also have tropical punch, strawberry, new flavors like sea berry and strawberry lemonade. Huh. You can enjoy this stuff, man. But don't take my word for it. I want you to stop what you're doing right now and head over to liquidiv.com. Use the promo code Duke Loves Wrestling so you get 20% off your entire order. I mean, anything that you order on liquidiv.com. So what are you waiting for? It's time for you to shop better hydration today. Use the promo code Duke Loves Wrestling over at liquidiv.com. Save yourself 20%. Stay hydrated. Most importantly, enjoy life. That's right. 